Where is Booster 10? What happened to it? Yes, today I am answering this most asked question. NASA finally gives update on plans for sample return from Mars. Hey, I'm Lucas. Welcome to the SpaceX community. Let's get started. The third Starship launch was a highly anticipated event. After months of waiting, the launch finally took place. The day started with the closure of a part of Highway 4 to ensure safety. The orbital tank farm then began its activity, indicating the start of the cooling process before fueling the Starship. However, the launch didn't initially go as planned. There were no signs of propellant being pumped into Starship's tanks. The delay was due to boats present in the keep-out area. But thanks to the upgrades done to the orbital tank farm, this delay wasn't a big issue. The fueling of Starship now only takes about 45 minutes. Consequently, propellant loading into Booster 10 began at T-53 minutes. This was a significant decrease from the previous hour and 37 minutes. Nine minutes later, Ship 28 also joined the fueling process. As the frost line ascended on the vehicle's propellant tanks, SpaceX began its official webcast. 20 minutes before liftoff, the engine chill began. This process involves circulating a small amount of propellant through the engines to gradually reduce their temperature. This is crucial to prevent a thermal shock that could result from exposing ambient temperature engine parts to large quantities of cryogenic liquids. The fueling of both rocket stages was completed with just two and a half minutes to go before liftoff. As the countdown ticked closer to zero, the flight director confirmed that the launch was a go. The flame deflector sprang to life, dousing the launch pad with water as 33 Raptor engines roared to life. With no issues detected, the beast known as Starship was released, and it began its ascent. Two minutes and 42 seconds after liftoff, all but three Super Heavy Boosters Raptors shut down. This was planned. Moments later, the ship ignited its three vacuum engines, followed by the firing of three atmospheric Raptors, marking its separation from the booster. This is known as hot staging, and it was executed flawlessly. As the ship continued to climb to space, the booster initiated its flip maneuver, performed by the three engines that remained active after most engines cut off or MECO. This flip also marked the beginning of the boost back phase. Unlike in the second mission, the prototype successfully reignited 10 engines from the second ring of Raptors. This maneuver allowed the booster to navigate back towards its designated landing site, a point in the Gulf of Mexico located about 30 kilometers or 18.6 miles from the shore. The boost back ended with an engine shutdown 55 seconds later. At first sight, the burn appeared to be a complete success. But if we look a little closer at the shutdown sequence, there may have been some issues. Raptors began to shut down in a circular pattern, but for some reason, that sequence paused for a few seconds before the rest of the engines were turned off. This might have been a simple telemetry glitch, but it's worth considering when looking at what happened next. As Booster 10 was near its apogee, it began a slow reorientation to the landing position using its vents, which also act as thrusters. Less than two minutes later, Super Heavy was just 50 kilometers or 30 miles above the surface. At this altitude, the atmosphere is dense enough for grid fins actually to have an effect on the rocket. The descent phase looked a bit violent, although this is also something we can sometimes observe during Falcon 9 landings. To perform a soft water landing, Booster 10 was supposed to reignite some of its engines and use them to decelerate to just 8 meters or 26 feet per second. That's not really what happened. The ignition sequence started just 1 kilometer or 0.6 miles above the water with the firing of one Raptor center, followed by two engines from the second ring. This wasn't even close to enough thrust to slow the booster down. Instead of touching down at 8 meters or 26 feet per second, Super Heavy smashed into the Gulf of Mexico at a speed of over 300 meters or almost 1,000 feet per second if the telemetry was correct. Technically, you can call this a water landing, just not a soft one. I'd like to quickly remind you to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already.
We regularly upload informative SpaceX and space news videos that you won't want to miss. Be sure to turn on the notification bell so you're notified whenever we release new content. Some of our viewers have mentioned they're not receiving notifications, which is frustrating. While we work on resolving this issue with YouTube, please double check your notification settings and ensure they're enabled. Thanks for your support. This is where the history of the legendary Booster 10 ended. Despite the unfortunate ending, the journey of Booster 10 provided valuable data and insights for future launches. The FAA has already instructed SpaceX to begin a mishap investigation. Hopefully, it won't take too long this time, as the company already has a backlog of prototypes waiting to be tested. According to Elon Musk, we should expect to see at least six more launches this year. Despite the setbacks, the future of space exploration continues to look promising. Now, we will discuss some latest updates from Mars, focusing on NASA's Perseverance rover and the mission to bring back samples from the Red Planet. So, let's start with a quick update on the Perseverance rover. Since its historic landing on Mars in February 2021, it has been busy at work. At the recent Lunar and Planetary Sciences Conference, scientists revealed that the rover has already collected a whopping 26 samples out of its 43 sample tubes. That's impressive progress. Now, what's inside these sample tubes? Well, most of them contain rock cores, giving us valuable insights into Mars's geological history. Two tubes contain regolith, basically Martian soil, and one holds a sample of the Martian atmosphere. The remaining three are witness tubes, used to identify any contamination from Earth. But here's where it gets even more exciting. NASA is planning the next phases of Perseverance's journey, including a trek to the crater rim of Jezero Crater. This area promises a diverse range of rocks, each with its own story to tell about Mars's past. Scientists believe these samples could hold clues to potential signs of past life on Mars, making this mission incredibly important for astrobiology. However, while Perseverance continues its mission on Mars, NASA is also working on the next steps for bringing these samples back to Earth. This is where things get a bit tricky. NASA had a plan in place for Mars Sample Return, MSR, but after an independent review board raised concerns about cost and schedule, NASA formed a response team to explore alternative approaches. The response team is expected to complete its work soon, with NASA set to release revised plans and budgets in April. This uncertainty has left MSR funding in limbo, with the fiscal year 2025 budget proposal listing it as to be determined. This means that while NASA is committed to MSR, they're still figuring out the best way to make it happen within their budget constraints. And speaking of budget constraints, NASA also needs to figure out how to allocate funding for MSR in 2024, as instructed by an appropriations bill. It's a challenging balancing act, but one that NASA is committed to navigating. Despite these challenges, NASA officials continue to emphasize the importance of MSR Lindsay Hayes, acting lead scientist for MSR at NASA headquarters, called it one of the highest priorities in recent decadal surveys and an agency priority. The samples collected by Perseverance could unlock the early history of terrestrial planets, providing invaluable insights into our solar system's past. But until NASA finalizes its plans for MSR, the scientific community is left in a bit of a holding pattern. Scientists are eager to explore beyond the crater rim with Perseverance and collect more samples, but they need to know the timeline and architecture of the mission first. Minakshi Wadwa, principal scientist for MSR at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, highlighted the importance of maximizing sample diversity for the mission's success. She's eagerly awaiting the outcome of the response team's work to see how it will shape Perseverance's future missions. In conclusion, Mars Sample Return is an ambitious mission that holds the potential to revolutionize our understanding of Mars and our solar system. While there are still challenges to overcome, NASA remains dedicated to making it happen. Thanks for watching today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Stay tuned for another great video tomorrow.